spiritual health without a sense of connectedness to something greater than yourself it is almost impossible so it is my honor and pleasure to welcome our own dr david martins this is going to talk about spiritual health assessment in healthcare so we're being interdisciplinary here is dr martins well i just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this presentation Spiritual Health Assessment in Healthcare Professional Practice and Education. In 1946, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not the mere absence of disease or infirmity. That was the beginning of this concept of holistic health. But a lot of people had issues with that definition because you see it included social well-being and many people argue that it should have included spiritual well-being. What we fail to realize is that social well-being actually floats on the foundation of spiritual well-being. The health of a group of people socially is actually determined by the spiritual well-being of the individual elements of that group. So just as you cannot really separate the components of health, you can define them to make them easier to understand, but you really cannot separate them. Look at how we define physical health. The ability to perform the bodily functions essential for life. So if you can go to work, if you can eat, if you can have children, if you can play, physically you're healthy. And then we say mental health is the ability to adapt to change and adopt the necessary coping skills. So if you cannot adapt to change, you either become anxious or depressed, or you might actually end up with a psychiatric illness. But look at those two entities. Stroke is a physical illness. It takes away your mobility. Well, will that affect your mental health? Yes. That is why depression is strongly associated with stroke. If you have hypertension that does not have any symptom, if you look at somebody with high blood pressure, they look physically healthy. But if that person goes into depression and they begin to self-neglect, they will end up with a stroke. That is a mental problem leading to a physical problem. What is even more important is that both physical and mental health are strongly rooted in the spiritual health. And there is a technical reason why WHO stayed away from defining spiritual health. Because in 1946, nobody wanted to talk about anything spiritual. Because we had just come from the era of humor, and demons, spiritual things, you will look like a voodoo doctor if you started talking spiritual things. But with time, we are, be we are becoming increasingly aware of the interconnectedness of spiritual health, mental health, and physical health. And people have struggled with the definition of spiritual health, but the best definition that I saw is this one from the Nursing Outcome Classification. It defines spiritual health as the connectedness with self, others, higher power, all life, nature, and universe that transcends and empowers self. That, my friends, is spiritual health. But if you just look at this definition and walk away, then you miss the point. You really have to take a good look at this definition and begin to break it down. Because you see, spiritual health 
in reality, is a personal pursuit for the ideal nature of man, the image of God. And in order for you to realistically pursue spiritual health, you need to have a model image. You need to have the, the path, that perfect model that you're aspiring to. And that is exactly what makes religion very critical in spiritual health pursuit. To me, your ideal image, your moral perfection statue is strongly anchored in your religious beliefs. And I do not believe that you can actually aspire to spiritual health without a sense of connectedness to something greater than yourself. It is almost impossible. Because the whole benefit of spiritual health is really anchored in this sense of connectedness to something greater than yourself. When you take a good look at people that we call spiritual, regardless of their religious affiliation, there are some things you can actually identify that is common to all of them. One of them is that they tend to have meaning and purpose in life that is usually relative to others and higher power. So spiritual people tend to see themselves as agents of good. They tend to take service to other people very primary in their lives. Humility is something that you will find among spiritually healthy people. And they have a very different sense of love. Spiritual people feel loved and cared for by this higher power, whatever that is. They feel loved and cared for. And in turn, they tend to believe that they have to therefore show love and care for other people that they come across. Again, regardless of their religious affiliations, spiritually healthy people tend to have this kind of sense of love. And because they are so, they feel loved, they tend to be motivated by dogmas and dictates that they hold very dearly. They are very obedient to their religious commitment. There is a difference between religion and religiosity. Religion is what you actually profess. Religiosity is what you practice. Truly spiritually healthy people tend to have these adherence to religious creeds and codes. And regardless what you do in society, you cannot find them to change their minds. And that is why they are often very vulnerable and easy recruits for evil. Because if you can tie your agenda to their religious commitment, you will get them to do anything. This is the way they experience spiritual health. But there is something else. There is the way they express it. If you are around a spiritually healthy person, regardless of their religious affiliation, you will feel their generosity. They're very given. They're the ones that will volunteer. They're the ones that will give money to a beggar in the, in the street. They tend to be very generous with time, with their treasures, with the things that they have that they may not need immediately. They also tend to be hospitable. And the way you see hospitality is that they are very accommodating. They will be the first to reach out and try to touch you. They bring you into their personal space very easily. They will reach out to you with a hug. And when, they, when you meet a truly spiritually healthy person, 
they are very objective. And by objectivity, I mean they tend to be free of prejudice and bias. One of the most remarkable demonstrations of objectivity among spiritual people is from this Jesuit priest, Father Luigi, who actually coined the term social justice. See, they moved St. Thomas Aquinas' teaching of equality past equality, because sometimes equality doesn't cut it. You need social justice. One other remarkable attribute of spiritual health is sensitivity. What is sensitivity? Sensitivity is actually an awareness of the needs of others that may be associated with their age, their gender, their race, their religion, their disease, or disability. The recognition and the willingness to accept that and respond to the need that those attributes, those personal attributes pose, whether in care settings or anywhere else. Sensitivity is a very critical component of spiritual health. And then tolerance. Tolerance as a phenomenon of spiritual health is actually your willingness to be aware and to accept imperfection as a common human experience. You're not perfect, so you don't look for imperfe perfection in other people. Religious, spiritually healthy people are very aware of this because most religions will first of all bring you to your knees by highlighting your imperfection. So you learn to be tolerant first of yourself and then of other people. So this is the way spiritual health is experienced and the way it is expressed. But why am I telling you all this? The reason I'm telling you all this is because we are coming to an era where we're talking about spiritual health. And I need you to understand that spiritual health is like any health endeavor. When people try to achieve physical fitness, they exercise. And sometimes they get hurt. So there is actual risk of physical injury with the pursuit of physical fitness. Sometimes people are so resilient that they can adapt to change and adopt the coping skills so well that you cannot get them to commit to anything. That lack of commitment is an unintended consequence of resiliency. The same way, belief in higher power, there is a risk to it. There is something called fatalism where people believe that everything that is going to happen to me is already predetermined and I can't change it. And they won't take their children for vaccination. <laughs> they will not do cancer screening. And they are the ones that will say, doctor doesn't need to do anything when it comes to DNR and advanced directives. That is a risk. So you see, in order for us to actually understand Spiritual health, we need to know that spiritual health has risks and it has benefits. Spiritual health endeavors do have risk and they have benefits. Look, some religion forbid the eating of blood and fat. Technically, they will be healthier. A lot of blood is a lot of salt. A lot of fat it's a lot of cholesterol. So just by obeying those food taboos, they will be healthy. So if you have a patient that confesses or professes a religion where these things are actually forbidden, 
That is one leverage you have to help them do what you need to do by anchoring it to their spiritual health beliefs. Muslims generally are forbidden from smoking and drinking. So if you have a Muslim patient, a good place to start out with your smoking cessation program might be, what does your, the Quran say about these things? But just as there are benefits, there are risks. Jehovah's Witness don't take blood transfusion. You need to plan for that in the care of a Jehovah's Witness patient. And the Pentecostal Holiness Churches in Appalachia, they still handle dangerous snakes and drink poison during their worship. It's part of their spiritual beliefs. So you see, in order for us as physicians to actually take care of people holistically, we need to understand that we have to manage spiritual health benefit. We have to monitor and mitigate spiritual health risks. This means we have to have a tool that gives us a very comprehensive assessment of this risk and benefits. Currently, that tool does not exist. When we started talking about spiritual health, the first scale that actually measures spiritual well-being was by Ellison in 1982. Then after that came hope. And hope is what we told medical students, find out the sources of hope, strength, comfort, love in the patient. The O is find out if they have an organized religion or religious affiliation. And then P is personal spirituality. Find out what this person does personally on their own because of their spiritual beliefs. And finally, the E is, do these spiritual beliefs have any effect whatsoever on end of life decision making? You see, there is nowhere else in, in healthcare that the importance of spiritual health becomes important as in the face of a dying person or a very sick person. I'll tell you a story. I was on admission taking care of patients and there was this girl that was dying, an 18 year old girl. She was dying of a cancer, a childhood cancer that was diagnosed late. From my interaction, the father is atheist. They don't believe in God, they don't believe in anything. The girl was dying. And each time the father would come to the door would say, John, hang in there, hang in there. And the girl would just nod her head. Two days before she died, the father came and peeped his head through the door and said, hang in there. She turned and looked at the father and said, Dad, there is nothing to hang on to. That is where you need something greater than you. You need an anchor. You really, spiritual health does not hang in a vacuum. It has to hang on something. Sometimes you see people, they will grab you as a nurse practitioner, nurse, a doctor in the hallway. They say, doctor, don't let my child die. That is not in my hands. But that tells me whenever people come at you like that, that is a spiritual void. Now they are transferring what they need to transfer to something greater than them to you. And you need to be able to decipher that and do what you need to do. Extremely important, especially at this time, when we talk about spiritual health assessment. Because you see, a lot is going to change. In order for us to truly understand where people are spiritually, we need to begin to understand that spiritual health is a pursuit, just like physical health. You have to exercise spiritually, just like you do physically, to be spiritually healthy. And that is why we're pioneering these Holy Ghost exercises. It's in the survey that I hope you all completed Holy Ghost is not Holy Ghost as in the Christian entity and phenomenon. It actually stands for the things we've talked about. 
You see, it is time for us as healthcare provider to step out of our comfort zones and begin to engage patients in things that matter. Humility is very crucial for health. You see, humility drives a cooperative and collaborative attitude. And you all know that this is nothing, there is no secret about it anymore. Hostility is associated with increased risk of death and can from cancer and cardiovascular disease. We know that. So we need to begin now to recognize and assess patients' level of humility. Because ultimately, that is going to determine their health. And they need to know that. Our patients are not connecting these things. Some of my patients with hypertension, they believe they can fight with their wives at home every day, smoke and drink, and then come to me and expect me somehow to give them a pill that will control their blood pressure. It's not going to happen. <laughs> because you see, blood pressure medications are formulated to antagonize some specific hormones in your system. And these hormones are released by specific activities. The dosages of these medications are computed based on normal levels of these hormones. So when you fight every day, and you smoke every day, you fight with your wife, beat your kids up, get into road rage, and now you have these super levels of catecholamines, and you expect me to give you some kind of a medicine that will counteract the effect of all of that, it's not going to happen. That is why you find some patients with hypertension, they're taking six, seven medications, and yet blood pressure is uncontrolled. It is time for us to begin to help people to connect these things. We need to get in the habit of asking people, if somebody says they're Christian, and you're seeing them in care setting, ask them, did you go to church last week? If your patient is Muslim, ask them, do you pray like you should? These are now valid clinical advice because we know scientifically that prayer and church attendance have been shown to prolong people's life. So you, just like you will recommend physical activity, you need to recommend spiritual health endeavors for patients. Love. You must feel love especially in inpatient services. Because you see, when people feel loved by something greater than them, they tend to have a very sincere, genuine sense of hope and trust in that thing. And that determines how they relate to death and dying. That even determines their outlook to that illness. Let me give you a good example. I don't know if you know Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford was a big time American lawyer in Chicago. He had some significant investment in real estate just before the Chicago fire, and he lost everything. So in order to have to recover from it, he decided to send his wife and his four daughters to England on vacation, and he was going to join them later. On their way to London, they had an, a sea disaster. The four daughters died. The wife survived. Then they told Horatio this news. He took it, fine. He decided to, to go to England to join his wife. Then when they got to the scene where his Four daughters died. Do you know what Horatio Spafford did? That was when he wrote that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Think about that. Why could he, at that time, think about writing a song like that? Because he feel loved and he knew that whatever this is, is going to pass. There's a reason for it. He could hang it on something. When Wallace Hartley and his men were singing with that violin on Titanic that was sinking, he there in a frenzy tossed that violin into the ocean and 
try to rush out of the place. That violin will not be what 1.7 million that it was sold for. But because they played that violin to death, that was what gave it the value. But why could these men do these things? What, what makes them different? Because they feel loved. And they know that no matter what is happening, it will always be okay. If your patients can relate to a superior power like this, then you will, not need, you will need a lot less anxiety pills. Because just their anchor will be coming enough. These are what I call the intrinsic muscles of spiritual health. Everybody needs them. Generosity is extremely important. You don't have to have money to be generous. You can volunteer. You can give time. And we know now there is something called help us high. There is definite health benefit to being generous. Hospitality, just being accommodating. Reach out and touch somebody. You see, before you can, although you look at hospitality, it tends to imply that bring people into your home. But the truth is that before you can bring people into your home, there must be room for them first in your heart. People don't go in your home without first entering your heart. So you can bring people in your heart and not take them to your home, and you would have served the same purpose. Hug somebody, touch them. Touching, the human touch, like you heard in that Rogers theory, does have something. There is something you transmit when you reach out to somebody that needs it. And objectivity, like I said, extremely important. And sensitivity, we already talked about. People need to be more sensitive. As providers, we need to recognize and respond to people's special needs by reason of their age, gender, race, disease, or disability. And of course, we need to be tolerant. As we're embarking on spiritual health as healthcare provider, I have to tell you that we are beginning to double into some real dangerous territories. Because in the spiritual realm, we don't have control anymore. And you know, the way we have dominated the field <coughs> till now is by maintaining control. We enjoy it. People come to us and we give them answers like we know everything. The truth is that if we're going to embrace spiritual health as it is supposed to be embraced, we are going to have to be willing to relinquish that control. The curriculum needs to change. Doctors, medical students, nursing students, all need to be made aware of the connection between these Holy Ghost exercises and actual health of people. They need to be trained on how do you assess it in patients. And then what do you do with deficits in those areas? How do you recommend spiritual health practices without necessarily messing with people's civil liberties. It's extremely important for us to learn how to do these things. But what is more important, what I see changing dramatically, is our practice humility. You see, as we go into the era of spiritual health assessment, the spectrum of diseases will change. Because there are real spiritual maladies that have real consequences. And we're going to have to deal with them as healthcare providers. The scope of cure will change. Just because there is no cure for it in the traditional Western way does not mean there is no cure. You have to now be willing and willing to be open to alternative therapies, part of relinquishing control. And one thing that I know will change that I'm so happy about is this prognostication. Because you see, we have come into an era now 
where we have become prophets instead of physicians. You see, when as a healthcare provider, you open your mouth and tell somebody that because of this illness, you are only going to live six months, that is not science. Because you see, that statement comes from statistics. It comes from a sample. And what you can really say to that patient is that most people with the condition that you have will be dead in six months. Most people, not this person. You see, what, that is prediction. But whenever you make a pronouncement and make it specific to that person, you're no longer predicting, you're prophesying. And if your prophecy does not come to pass, then you'll become a false prophet. <laughs> then when you become a false prophet, then you lose, people lose faith in you. And that is the reason, one of the reasons behind the mistrust of the healthcare establishment. Because we are going beyond our boundaries and practicing things that we're not truly really licensed to practice. How do you begin to lead your patients to mindfulness and to spiritual health? A good place to start is mindfulness. Mindfulness. You need to be aware of your feelings. You need to be aware of your thoughts. The reason that is important is because we don't determine what comes into our minds but we get to choose what we're going to dwell on in our minds. And it's your religious greed that helps you make that decision. Because ultimately, your thoughts becomes your acts. Your acts becomes your habits. Your habits becomes your character. And your character determines your comorbidities. Thank you. <laughs> wow, awesome. that, that's interesting. Dr. Martin will stay around and, uh, for the panel discussion. One thing I will take um, the, the maybe negative comment, that one thing that's lacking in, uh, in this uh, conference, I will make sure it doesn't happen next year, is that we don't have time for questions. So our panel will answer the questions later. So I hope the presenters will please hang around uh, because I'm sure Dr. Martins has a lot, um, will have a lot of questions. <laughs> so hold your houses, he will be around. Um, Holy Ghost will keep him here. <laughs>